here. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, do you, are you seeing my screen? And is the sound okay? Yep, everything sounds okay. Okay, so thank you very much, Robert, for this introduction. My firm indeed is called Their Peasant Consulting. Uh, also running sort of a nonprofit called ATHT.org, which is a single person nonprofit, which is not even registered as such. Uh, all these slides are, all of course, creative commands and will be released. Uh, I'll send the details thereafter. So I'm going to talk about navigating innovation and humanitarian action and the fact that we need maps for navigation. So some recap of what you explained, Robert, of my past contribution to um, this effort. So I've spent a lot of time within uh, helpful engineering during 2020, in which I educated a lot of the members uh, within Elpool as well as around Elpool and created what I would call a skeleton of a quality system because complying with the regulation, one of the key requirements is to implement a quality management system. So I created a set of very basic templates for teams, project teams within Elpool to try to implement. I gave speeches to earlier iteration of this conference, discussing the importance of risk management when doing um, product development in general, medical and health technology development even more. And I looked into what the open source approach, how does it impact these risk management processes. I talked about the regulations themselves and try to find out whether or not they are compatible with the concept again of open source development. That was my second talk last year. And in this evolution, I quit literally pool engineering for many reasons, starting from burnout so the fact that I didn't have the time anymore to spend with those efforts. And also some discrepancy of what I would call value alignment, and which led me to seek other purpose with uh, my voluntary contribution to this work. And that's what I chose to do through ATHT, which is why I created something independent to focus on transparency rather than the scope of health engineering. So how, how did this go, creating a helpful QMS? As far as I know, it has not been used by anyone. Um, so talks about risk management and uh, regulation versus open source, and even the continuum of my support to several teams through ATHT, a lot of the feedback I got is always in the form of uh, if only we had examples or if only we had uh, templates or if only consultants were not so expensive that we could afford those templates and this sort of thing. But those things and they, ex they exist, not only what I created through helpful engineering, but for instance, a company called Tidepo which uh, was mentioned yesterday in one of the command but which I've been following for several months, who addresses uh, equity in access to diabetes management tools, has released open source the entire stack, not only the technology, but also all the regulatory submissions and all the documentation they have submitted to the FDA. Not only that, but tight pool, is even part of the pool of eight manufacturers that are partnering with the FDA to develop their own regulation for software as a medical device. I, I won't really 
members of those communities to understand the scope of this sort of achievement and the contradiction with maybe some of the conclusions I was presenting earlier in my involvement that between regulations and open source, there may be some frictions. But the more it goes, the least I believe there's direct friction there. I think those two things are completely compatible. Um, OpenRegulatory.com are also sharing a whole lot of templates that are all released under the Creative Commons uh, license to help entrepreneurs, volunteers, whoever is interested, implement uh, quality system compliant type of documentation. Analytics is a third one hosted on GitHub, which is more focused on software only project that would be a bit trickier to adapt that to hardware, but that's completely doable. So, so just a few examples of other um, achievements and other resources that are available to all communities um, that can be implemented. So to me, the summary of this availability of resources is a proof that regulation are not this evil obstacle that they are quite often uh, finger pointed for and there may be some other things that needs to be sorted out first to achieve our goals so i'll skip this one so what is actually our goal so by us, our goal, I mean all these NGOs and potentially even government actors and community actors that seek to solve a problem, to find a solution for this problem, to help a user or a patient somewhere in an ecosystem already containing maybe payers and insurance and an health system and looking at uh, humanitarian action to find also source of financing for this translation from problem to solution through donor, philanthropists, and again, potentially government through grants and this sort of funding. So I would say that's a very basic map of what, in, what is humanitarian action. If you look at a map of innovation into health tech, it's very similar instead of those NGOs, we have what Robert called firm, which being French Australian, I'm very not sure what is the scope really of a firm. Does it go as far as a single entrepreneur? Is it synonym with capitalism? Is it synonym with fact of being commercial? Is it synonym with commercial corporate? I'm not too sure, but it doesn't matter the exact limit. It's something that operates, I believe, for profit, being the difference with the previous one. But it also means that the source of fundings becomes the target of the problem resolution. You don't seek someone else to pay for solving the problem of your target. Somehow we need to find a montage that the target can pay itself. You start then, so realizing that these two missions are so similar, you want to investigate how the fact of a solution being for profit or not. So we have said that between corporate and humanitarian action, does it matter or not to be for profit? We can ask the same question with, with open source. Does it matter or not to be open source or proprietary? Does it matter or not to be volunteer or paid? And we can go even further by taking into account the concept of social enterprise, which is somehow sitting in the middle of that, and looking at all the other actors that need to be involved into this problem solution um, resolution action. All these actors, including ones that are not really mentioned often, the big consulting company, Deloitte, McKinley, the World Economic Forum, 
uh, the World International, sorry, Intellectual Property Office, the ISO that issues the standards. And, uh, there's other bodies issuing standards, the regulators that are more or less independent from their government, and academia in the middle. So all this complexity needs to be mapped. To, we need to understand as projects where we stand in this very complex ecosystem. We need to understand that this ecosystem is obviously multidimensional. That's not something with a single axis going through a diagonal between commercial action on one side and volunteer action on the other side with volunteer going necessarily with open source and going necessarily with non-profit while on the other end of the axis you would have the commercial actions that want profit that is motivated by capitalism etc etc all those different dimensions are independent from each other and every single project can implement their own path to solve a problem through this dimension without having to encapsulate themselves into a given category. To be able to navigate, we need both to understand where we are and where we're going. So to be able to do that, understanding What's around you and the other projects is something that I believe is fundamental and the other actors. So that's why I'm really, really, really thankful, Robert, for you organizing this conference uh, like you did the two previous years. I really, really enjoy this multidisciplinary approach of trying to bring together people from various domains. Obviously, uh, that's work in progress. No, I didn't see anyone from big consulting as so far, I haven't seen anyone from the intellectual properties office and this sort of institution. And I hope that maybe my contribution can be to suggest those as ideas for the next iteration. And I would love to come back then, of course, for this discussion. Uh, but it's still hard and I haven't provided any map. And I would even have even, I would add even more difficulty because not only we need to map this external ecosystem, the environment around us. But if you want to be able to do a contribution, I believe we need to achieve something in agreement with ourselves. And we need to be able to, sorry, to understand also the historical dimension of all that, because that's not something static, that's something that evolves. But we need also to understand the alignment of our action with our internal values or internal maps of values, which can relate relatively easily with uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, but that may not be the same for everyone. And part of the reason I think it's important is personal experience. Again, the burnout, for instance, of helpful, the creation of ADHD, to advocate for transparency. That's to avoid cognitive dissonance and to avoid uh, burnout. One need to work with this good agreement. And one needs to define the whole concept of open source. Why is it that we are attached to it? I would say attached to it because I can't find another way to describe it at this stage. And again, Robert, I want to thank you for the openness of your invitation to this conference and of the manifesto itself, which I still haven't signed. And like you say, some of the speakers may not agree with it completely. To me, there's this aspect of open source in the middle, the open source techniques. I'm not com completely sure that I believe into the value of open source as a development technique to achieve impact with medical technology. I don't know if it's because I believe in the strength maybe of uh, the capitalist 
mechanism of the market to create technology. I believe in it enough maybe to prefer to spend my time on a commercial venture to advise those company with at the same time my ethos to make sure they achieve positive things and potentially contribute to humanitarian efforts uh, with a commercial point of view anyway while choosing to put my volunteer time in the promotion of transparency indeed and the other green aspect I found in this manifesto of shared cooperative standards because this is indeed fundamental to a safer and more trustworthy implementation of technology, regardless of technology being for profit or non for profit. We need to trust technology and talking about you no know, access to health, access to care. The problem of flattening the curves in developed countries, the problem of uh, health systems that are saturating in developed countries, that's a problem that is worth solving as well. You know, not only helping the low and middle income countries, but also our own countries, if we live in developed countries, is something that matters. And I think we also have a responsibility to improve our developed framework to be able to provide better examples and better inspirations for developed countries to develop their own framework. I'm thinking back to the regulations. That's not something that is new. The African continent and many countries in Africa are working on developing their own regulatory ecosystem. In the absence of other examples, they are of course, looking at the FDA and of course, looking at the European system to implement the framework. So it's important for us to be here to critique and provide inspiration for our own system to evolve. And that's where I chose to put my values and my uh, advocacy efforts towards ensuring that the regulations and the implementations themselves are more transparent because I think that's where there's a lot of risk into losing trust into the technology if anti-vaxxers don't believe in vaccine, don't believe in science, which end up clogging up, clogging up the health system, etc., etc. And standard, for instance, is another battlefront for me in a sense that they are behind paywall, the same way scientific papers were all behind paywall a while ago. They are pay behind the paywall because they are protected by copyright. Copyright, by definition, it's a law that's meant to protect creative work. I don't believe a technical standard is something that is creative because the standard must be accurate to industry standards which already exist, have already been created. The creation is past. The bodies and institutions in charge of creating the standard are not creating something. They are just taking a snapshot of it. They are just explaining it. And rather than fighting or trying to burn out myself, trying to develop an open source technology, I thought I would make more valuable expense of my time by fighting for open standards only and giving those open standards to entrepreneurs and innovators with medical technology regardless of whether they are profitable for profit or not. Um, Pierre, I know I stole uh, five minutes from you at the beginning, but um, yep. can you finish up in just five minutes? And we do have a couple of questions uh, from the audience here. Definitely, Robert, and I was this time planning to be good, to be short. I know you have been very good with me being ultra long in the past. I just had a couple of slides. One where the questions I screenshot yesterday related to regulation. So Alex asking about whether the 
I'm not too sure exactly what is the uh, scope of Alex's question, but I refer him to my research gate page. And I talk about the IMDRF in several of my slideshows already, and all these links I will copy paste into Google Docs. But I think that's really meant by the fact that different countries should try to unify their regulatory system. Uh, as that about you no know, OS documentation for ISO 13485 compliance system. And Jenny, yesterday, I think your question was a bit related. So the three link I showed in my second slide uh, are all open quality management systems that we can get inspiration from. Uh, so I just wanted again to thank you, Robert, you know, quoting a French philosopher. Uh, you asked yesterday whether you weren't sure whether the um, symposium, this conference are useful. I would say regardless of whatever answer are found today, yes, for the questions asked, that, for, that is useful. And thank you very much. So thank you very much, um, Pierre. Um, let me read you a comment uh, from that's been submitted by the Q&A system from an anonymous attendee. We must also think with volunteer and paid, the fact paid can be a way to be more equal and less exploitative. It's a complex issue where we can have a mix of all of the above categories and have transition between them to enable change for good. Yes, yes it is. Uh, you know, we were talking in Rehive uh, just at the end of the conference that we need to pay more people. Um, the organizations that are in this conference need to raise more money and get more grants. Um, Public Convention only has $20,000 in the bank right now. We, we cannot pay um, people what they're worth uh, for the number of people who have volunteered. Nonetheless, I do feel it is a moral duty for me to spend more energy trying to raise more money so we can pay more people. Um, uh, here is a question from Shmuel Yershalmi. Yershalmi, for, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. What do you think about quick emergency certification procedure for all inventions can to support face global respiratory diseases like COVID-19 pandemic? So basically, yeah. I think that's what do you think about quick emergency certification procedures? Yeah, um, I, I think the regulators have done a very decent job with that. Not a perfect job, but definitely a decent job. I, I kept during 2020 praising the FDA who blew my mind on their agility into implementing those things. You know, my history with the FDA was that of an elephant, slow moving institutional body. Uh, I was very impressed by the sharpness of the answer with the EU8. Without that, all the efforts that have been discussed yesterday by USMS, the same thing by Helpful, etc., would never have existed. You no, know, to be honest, my only contribution to Helpful was to say pretty much, yeah, you can do that because the FDA has lowered the bar. Uh, but I want to say, don't make it an easy target to say, oh, we just need the regulator to lower the bar because they also lower the bar for the vaccine, thankfully. But all these anti-vaxxers and those podcasters on Spotify uh, are using those arguments to say, don't get vax. It's not safe. It has not been proven. So there's really a balance of how much certification, how much testing, how much this, how much that. And again, uh, what matters here is asking the question, you know, is there is there a perfect spot of safety and effectiveness versus time to market? No, there's not. And scratching your head and banging your head trying to find the perfect spot, no way. Better asking the question and inspiring transparency so people can have trust in the certification that has been done. Okay. Yeah, let me say that, you know, I believe transparency is the key to testing in open source environments, that we can create a culture where we publish test data in a way that the commercial firms do not, which will make open source devices more trustworthy. Now that has almost nothing to do with regulation, but it has a lot to do with improving the quality of those devices. And by the way, I am not, I don't believe we need to significantly change regulatory regimes in the United States. Um, but there are two questions here that talk about international regulation that are related. Nick Cap asked, 
how do we make the regulatory systems robust yet simple and inexpensive? And Azad Mashari writes, there have been some efforts to unify medical device regulations internationally. What is the state of these efforts? And before you answer, Pierre, I want to point out um, that um, Dr. Nelson Everbaroni, I may not be pronouncing his name correctly, he's going to be on a panel in just about an hour, um, has proposed something like that for Africa. I'm not familiar with it, but he may be discussing that um, in the panel. Go ahead, Pierre. Yeah. So in, in terms of unification, you know, so traditionally, this effort has been called harmonization. Uh, you need to understand that something that's quite often uh, mixed, you know, com confusingly mixed by entrepreneurs and volunteers alike, is the fact that regulation and technical standard are two different things. All regulations, so written by political entities, governments and their agents, uh, all encourage the use of technical standards to demonstrate compliance with the regulation, but they are never the regulation. And definitely, to me, that's an issue. Uh, so the regulators themselves have worked on harmonizing that to make sure, for instance, the same revision of the technical standard would be accepted in all the countries at the same time. Uh, so this effort is called harmonization. It has been done by something called the Global Harmonization Task Force for something like 20 years. Then it was turned into something called the IMDRF, the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, that I think is eight years old. They progressing, but it's painfully slow because I think here we need something, um, we, we need really a shift of paradigm from the regulator into themselves adopting open and transparent standards. I think within the FDA, there's some uh, attraction to that, or some entities within the FDA are very gravitating toward that. The European model is sadly a mess, to be honest. It has been a very painful transition for the world industry to go to the new European regulation. And asking for the, the question before about you now, how do you see it becoming more, more robust and less expensive? I, I think that's the only way indeed. And as a consultant, sometimes I feel like promoting open source quality system and maybe uh, sowing this branch I'm sitting on, but I'm not. And I think I really, no, the concept of mapping, I'm quite happy to share my maps as an open source thing, as a creative command. And a lot of consultants would like to do that as well. And to value that time as a guide, as a navigation, as a pilot, to guide companies for high fees into navigating that, and for communities to have access to the same tools and the same maps for free. That's okay. really, it's a concept of intellectual property versus know-how that was very important yesterday that was discussed. Okay. I think as consultant, we need to do that. So these are very complicated um, issues. Um, I have to cut you off here, Pierre, but let me remind everybody, Megan, can you please post the Rehive link? Um, we would like, uh, if Pierre has, has time, I don't know what part of the world he's in right now, <laughs> um, but if, if he has time, if it's not the middle of the night for him, could you please go <laughs> to Rehive? And um, I made a mistake yesterday. We called it the speaker's table, where it's actually now called meet the speakers. So I'd like Pierre to go to that table at Rehive. And those of you who have questions, you're going to miss Larry's talk, I'm afraid, if you talk to him right now, but it's okay. You might want to leave Zoom, go to Rehive, ask Pierre a question, then come back and hear Larry's talk. Um, by the way, Larry is going to talk about commercialization of open source devices, which gets to some of the things that, um, that Pierre talked about. So, um, of course, you, you don't have to, but um, the, the issues that Pierre is talking about are so complicated, they require a face-to-face -face conversation. So those of you who have questions, I recommend you go to Rehive um, either now or, or maybe later and try to talk to Pierre um, precisely. Uh, 
Okay. Um, those of you who have asked extra questions, James Coburn, I'm afraid we're going to have to answer that in Rehive, uh, if you can go there. Um, okay. now, I'm doing well. Uh,